Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis 32, verse 22. Genesis 32. Verse. I'll read from 22. Now he arose that same night and took his two wives and his two maids and his eleven children and crossed the ford of Jabrook. He took them and sent them across the stream, and he sent across whatever he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh, so that the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated. While he was wrestling with him, then he said, Let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. He said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with man and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you asked my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob named the place Penel. For he said, I have seen God face to face. Yet my life has been preserved. Now the sun rose up. Upon him, just as he crossed over to Penel, from per, over to Penel, and he was limping on his thigh. Therefore, to this day, the sons of Israel do not eat the sinew of the hip, which is on the socket of the thigh, because he touched the socket of Jacob's thigh in the sinew of the hip. Amen. Then Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming, and four hundred men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids. He put the maids and their children in front, and Leah and their children next, and Rachel and Joseph last. But he himself passed on ahead of them, and bowed down to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Then Esau ran to meet him, and embraced him, and fell on his neck, and kissed him, and they wept. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank and praise you, Lord, for the privilege of preaching and ministering your word this morning, Lord. I ask in the holy name of your son Jesus, Lord, that you would anoint me to preach your word, Lord. That you would use me as your vessel, as your instrument, as your mouthpiece this night, my Father God. Lord, that you speak to me and speak to others in this place, Lord. That we would leave this place, Lord, transformed by your word, Lord. Lord, I ask in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you help me preach and minister your word, Lord. Not by knowledge of what I know, my Father God. Not by vain glory, my Father God, but by your spirit this night, Lord. Pray you help me in all these areas, my Father God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Do you know um, this is the second time, if you read, if you read, go through the book of Genesis, this is the second time that Jacob has met with God. The first time is in um, the first time is he, the first time he he, had, he was leaving. He was running away and he he uh, laid on a rock and uh, he had a, a vision, a dream of uh, angels descending from earth to heaven. I just want to tell you about Jacob. Jacob was chosen by God. He is a patriarch. He's one of the patriarchs of Israel. He's a patriarch of all the Abrahamic faiths as well. So if you Jews first, Christians and Muslims, they all stem their origins back to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Now, God had promised Abraham that you will, you will leave this land what you're in, which is Iraq. He said, you will go to Canaan, a promised land, which I'm going to give you, and your descendants are going to be like the stars in the sky. Sometimes he says like the sand on the seashore. And then uh, Abraham had a son named Isaac. The same promise was to Isaac. And the same promise was to Isaac's son. Now, Jacob was a twin. Jacob wasn't the first, first one born. The, the other twin was born first, Esau. So by the birthright, by human by fright, like so, like it, like the the queen died, her oldest son become king, and when he dies, his oldest son will become king, and that's how that's how it passed on. And the same thing with the birthright; it was always given to the oldest son. 
But what had happened was God had always already chose Jacob. Jacob was already in line for that. That was never, ever going to be Esau's job. That was always, yes, Esau would be blessed. Yes, Esau, God would have his hand upon him. But God had already chosen Jacob. But what happened was Jacob was crafty. He was uh, sly and deceitful. Uh, He was a robber. Whatever you think he was, he was crafty. And all them things in the world, he was a very worldly man. And some men would call it cleverness. Some men would call it craftiness. And what he'd done was he... Because his, bro- his, his old dad was going blind and he couldn't hardly see, he, the, the old man would feel the difference which son it was. He would know the difference by feeling him. And uh, anyway, he clothed himself in goat hair and he went to the man and, he, he, and the old man filled him and then he said, oh, you're, are you Esau? He said, yeah, I'm Esau. You don't sound like Esau, you sound like Jacob. Anyway, he convinced him. And the blessing that he was giving to what should have been Esau's, he gave to Jacob. Now, when Jacob had heard this, yeah, Jacob said to him, uh, when Esau, sorry, heard what Jacob had done, Esau said, the next time I see you, I'm going to kill you. You're dead. Because if you imagine, he's taken away everything that this man, you know, they, these men are, are, are not like, we think of them when they think, oh, we think like being boys and stuff, but they're not, they're, they're men. They're probably in their 30s. And he's, he's took everything away from it. Everything that belonged to Esau, everything that Esau should have had, every birthright that Esau had, he's took away by deceit. By, but it was always in God's plan. Even if this hadn't have happened, even if Jacob wouldn't have done this thing, it was always in God's plan for God to use Jacob. So he fled. He fled to, back to Iraq. And he goes back to the country where he's, and he meets, he goes back to where, he's, where Abraham come from, where Isaac come from, where Rebecca, his mother, come from. And he went back to this place and he, he come upon his uncle, Labian. Now, Labian was exactly the same map. This is where it come from. This is where Jacob got all his craftiness or his slyness, whatever it is. That's where it come from because Labian was exactly the same man. And he come there, he had nothing. He just crossed the, the Jordan with a staff. That's all the Bible said. He had nothing at all. Went to his uncle. When he's got to his, it's his great uncle. When he got to his uncle like there, he sees Rebecca which is going to be his future wife. And he said to his uncle, uh, I want to marry her. And his uncle said, well, you work for me seven years. And when you work for me seven years, then you can marry her, like a dowry. You, you pay for her and then you can marry And uh, after the seven years was up, he thought he was marrying Rebecca. He never ended up marrying that Labian done a crafty one. And he ended up marrying the sister, Leah. Now, Leah wasn't a good looking girl by the looks of things. She wouldn't have been the first choice. She was like... He must have looked at her and thought, oh, what's happened here? Do you know what I mean? So he went back to his uncle. His uncle was his father-in-law now. And he said to him, you've tricked me. I, I thought it was... And he said, no, no, no. He said, so it's not... It's not. You know, it's usual for the older sister to go f- to marry first and not the... I give him all flannel, he said, anyway. He worked another seven year for Rebecca. So now he's got two wives. He worked the other seven year, and he had the, so now he's got two wives, Leah and Rebecca, and then he's worked another six year after that, and all the time that he's been working for his father-in-law, his father-in-law has become rich, very rich, right? Now it's not through again through it could be through uh, when we read it because he was a bit sly with the when he was at the urge and but God is blessing Jacob. And let me tell you something, if you're in a place, no matter where you're stopping at, and you're, you're born again, and you know the Lord Jesus Christ, your Lord and Saviour, and you've truly met with him, and you live at that place, let me tell you something, you will bless the people around you. I don't mean financial or anything, but you will bless the people around you, because eventually they're going to ask questions. Why is that man and woman different? Why do they go to church? Why don't I hear them sweat? Well, it shouldn't be. Why don't I hear them swearing? Why don't I hear them doing this? And they ask questions, arms up, and next thing you know, they're in church. Whether they accept or not is down to them. But they come to church. And because of that, you are a blessing. And this is what happened with Jacob. God is blessing Laban, who didn't deserve it. Laban's a pagan. He don't believe in God. Anyway, after the, after the 20, he's been there 20 years now. He's got 11 children. Well, he's got 12 children. doesn't mention the girl, but he's got 11 children. Uh, he's decided to creep out of a night time. He's not going to, because he knows his father or not going to let him go. And by now, he's got more than his father-in-law. He owns more in, in money and whatever you want to get in goods than his father-in-law. So he's left by night. He's three days journeying. His father-in-law said, he said he's gone. He's, he's followed him. When he's gone to him, he's going to kill him. 
God has told Laban in a dream, when you see him, I don't you do any, I don't you say anything wrong to him. I don't you do anything bad to him. I just want you to leave him, let him go. And, uh, but Rebecca chored an household god, like a little statue, like a little, uh, a little statue. She chored it and took it with her. You know, uh, another point that I see with that as well is that if you have got a god that somebody can come into your trailer or your house or your chalet or whatever and they can pick it up and take it, then that's not a very good god to have. If somebody can come to you and they can threaten you or they can uh, start say things or they can make you doubt, you know, they can't say, oh, is God real? God's not, oh, look where God's done this and that and the other. And they can take that away from you, then the God you serve isn't real. It's not a very good God. Because the God we serve, the God we praise and worship in this church, fills the whole earth. He's everywhere, all at once. He's too big to be put into a statue. He's, t- he's everywhere, all at once. You can't limit him down to a little thing that you can pick up and put it in your pocket. Anyway, Laban catches up and goes to him and uh, makes a covenant with him. <laughs> I'll read the covenant, what he said. He sets up a pile of stones between the... Between the two... Between... He sets up a pile of stones, him and Jacob do and this is what, and I've seen people have this on wedding rings, by the way. And it shouldn't be on a wedding ring. It says this, may the Lord watch between you and me when we are absent from one another. It sounds good, doesn't it? That sounds good. It sounds, like, it sounds like something you should put on a wedding ring, isn't it? But if you read before that, he was saying this, if you cross these powerful stones, I'm going to kill you. If you come this way, these, these stones that I've set up, if you come this way and you cross them, I'm going to kill you. And if I come to the other side and come towards you, I'm going to do harm to you. And if you don't look after me girls and me grandchildren, like I say, that's when that comes in. The Lord's going to watch between us. So it was a covenant. It wasn't like, a, oh, this is all happy and lovely. It was like, if you cross this road, if you cross this, this pile of stones, we're going to have war. And then, so he said that he's left him. But now, so he's had that fear behind him. He's had his father-in-law chasing him. He's had all the fear. He's had a 20-year um, living under the a cosh, if you like. He's had all this. Now it's time. God has put, prompted in his heart. Because if you read before this, even though he had the dream, even though God has spoke to him the dream, Jacob has never prayed. He's never, ever prayed. So now he's come into this place and now he's come to a fear. He thinks to himself, I, I know it's like, it's, God, it's like God has pressed upon his heart because this two things happen. God is making him go back to, to Israel, Canaan. He's making him go back there. But God is also telling him that that's where your inheritance is. That's not the money because he's got plenty of money now. It's not that he's saying, that's where your inheritance is. That's where your birthright is. That's where your family is going to come from. That's where the promises of God are, is in that place in Israel, in, in Canaan. That's where it's at. You've got to go back there. And I'm telling you, if you're in a backslidden state in this place tonight, and you don't know, and you think you're, you're out there, or you're wishy-washy with church, or you're not where you should be with the Lord, let me tell you something, go back to where the promises are. Amen. And it isn't, isn't in these four walls. It's going back to the foot of the cross. Amen. It's going back to Jesus Christ. It's saying, it's like going back there, you say, listen, I know that, because let me tell you something, anybody who's backslidden, they will tell you there's a million reasons, a million reasons why they don't have to come back to church. They can put, they, they don't like the people in the church, mm-hmm. they don't like whoever, they don't like this one, they don't, it's too far, uh, there are too much in the world, uh, how can God forgive me? All these, all these things come up, right? But let me just tell you something. Put that to one side. That's a fear. That fear needs to be put away with and you need to be come back to the foot of the cross. Because let me tell you something. Just like Jacob, he was 540 mile away, I think he was. Just like him, you need to come back to where the promises are. And let me tell you, for me and you as a Christian, the promises for us are at the foot of the cross. They're not in this world. So anyway, he goes up, so he's had this fear. God has showed him, he stopped the night before he's done this. He stopped the night in the place. But in the um, first verse of 32, it says this. Now Jacob went on his way. On his way, the angels of God met him. Now, what's happened there is, is that, and it seems like a short verse, but a lot has happened. God, because what we don't realise as Christians... Is that there is angels all the way around us. There's a spiritual realm that we can't see. And if God, what God has done here to Jacob is like he's, he's like he's holding back the curtain and let Jacob sin the angels. Let Jacob sin what's gardening, what's helping him. There's a, you know, he's saying there's two camps there. 
there's, there's a camp of angels and there's these camps. So there's not only one lot of people no more, there's two lots and the other lots are guarding angels. That, bit of, that should have been enough. Let me tell you something, when you read in the Bible, one angel defeats armies. Mm. So if you've got a camp of angels, yeah, if you've got all that round you and he's let, and he's let Jacob sit it, there's no need for him to fear. He knows 400 men's coming, but there's no need for him to fear because of the camp of angels. But, you know, as soon as that's not sin, as soon as we turn away from them, because how many, how many of us, right, how many of us have had miracles done in our lives? How many times we say that God has showed up just in time or we thought we was in an impossible situation or there's nowhere else and God has showed up and he's turned the impossible possible? All of us have got testimonies like that, haven't we? But we're too easy to forget them, aren't we? We're too easy to forget them. So he comes to this place. He said God has showed him his angels. Now he's in fear. After he's seen this, and verse 9 says this, it says, it's the first time he prayed. Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, the God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, return to your country and to your relatives, and I will prosper you. I'm unworthy of your loving kindness and all your faithfulness, which you have shown your servant for you, for you, with you, my staff only, I crossed this Jordan, and now you have made me become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he will come and attack me and the mothers and with the children. For you, you said, I will surely prosper you and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which is too great to be numbered. It's not like God is, you know, when he's prayed that prayer, he said, you said, you said to God. It's not like he's reminding God because God has forgot. God already knows. But sometimes we need to pray that ourselves. We need to be reminded what God has given us. What God is doing for us. What the promises that God has had. Never will I leave, leave you. Never will I forsake you. Do you know what I mean? The Bible says that he's an ever-present help. All these things we've got to remember that God is there. And sometimes we can say to the... When we pray to the Lord, we can say that when you're a trial or your tribulation, you can say, Lord, your word says that you're an ever-present help. Please help me do that. Lord, your word says that you will never leave me for, or forsake me. You know, you can, you can pick up them things and say, Lord, you've said this. And I want to, in faith, believe it, that you can do these things. And God will. So he said the prayer. He's, he said the prayer. He's come to the... And then it says there he passed over. He went over to the uh, Jebrook, to a, a stream. And he's left everything one side. And Jacob was left alone. Verse 24 says, Jacob was left, al left alone. Do you know, I want to tell you something, right? I want to tell you, and, and Christians in this place are know. When you go through hard and difficult times, when you, go to, when you go through times where faith seems to fail you, your faith, not God's, it seems to fail you, when it seems like there's no way out, when it seems like no matter what you do, when you can't chuck money at it, when you can't work for it, when you can't go to a special meeting, where you can't go to a preacher and have your hands put and prayed for, when you can't do nothing like that, when everything is stripped away, all that you add... All that you think, all your craftiness, all your way of getting out of things, all of that, when all that's stripped away and you're left alone, let me tell you something, you're going to come into the presence of the Lord. Because you need to be, we need to be empty before we can be full of God. Because if you're filling yourself up with, Lord, help me set up the situation. Ah, but if I do this and I do that, I'll get out of it. Or, Lord, help me, do I go to this place? And you, you just keep thinking to yourself, yeah, I've prayed the prayer, but now I'm going to do my bit. Let me tell you something, you're not waiting on the Lord. You'll just think, you, all you're doing is you think to yourself, oh, that's an insurance policy. What I'll do is I'll do what I want, and then I'll pray, so if I get it wrong, God will show up. But let me tell you something, that's now how God is. God wants you and me to rely on him for everything. For everything in our, big or small, he wants us to rely on him. They have that relationship with him. You know, like the ones that have got young children, who got babies here, right? Your children rely on you. Yes, they play up. Yes, they chuck the... the dummies out the prams they do all that but they rely on you to feed them to clothe them to make sure everything's all right when they're ill and they're sick that you take them to your all this goes on right you that your children your babies rely on you and that's how god wants us to be he wants us to fully rely on him so whatever whatever mistake whatever situation whatever circumstance you're in no matter what it is god wants you to rely on him and it's a very easy for me to say that. It's very easy for me to say that to you, but it's very hard sometimes for me to do that. It's very hard to me sometimes to think that, um, you know, uh, you like, like, you know, when somebody's having, like my little, my little grand girls have an operation and we've been praying for a long, long time, yeah? And what you, you're praying for a long time, but at the same time, 
I know that God has got his hand upon her for how things are happening. But at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, is there any other way we can do this? Is there some other... Do you know what I mean? It's not fully relying on God. And we've got to get over that barrier. We've got to say, Lord, listen, there's camps of angels around us. God has kept me this far. God has took me out of a place where I didn't belong. God has took me out of the clutches of a man that just wanted to rob me blind. God has took me from a place that is, is, is barren and there's nothing there. And the promises of God isn't there. He's took me from there and he's taken me back. And now I've got this other problem, which Christians do have. We have problems all the time. There's no such thing as an easy ride being a Christian. There's no such thing. So we've had all these problems and now he's come to this and he's thinking to himself, the last time I met him, The last time I see him, he said, the next time I see you, I'm going to kill you. And you can imagine how how stressed he is, how worried he is. He's not only thinking for himself now. He's thinking, because he just prayed it, if they kill me, they're going to kill all my descendants, which means his 11 sons and his his wives, he's going to, everything, everything that's there, everything that's built up, everything that he loves, he thinks that Esau is going to take away. But he prayed. And he asked the Lord, and then he was left alone. And it says there, verse 24, it says, And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. You know, that's called a Christophancy. That's Jesus in the Old Testament. That's Jesus showing up in the Old Testament. Um, it doesn't say it there. Jacob said it. I've wrestled with God, God at the end of it. If you, I think the book of Amos says it as well, that Jacob wrestled with God all night. Let me tell you about wrestling with the Lord. You might be in this place and you might be wrestling with God with a sin in your life. It might be an habit that you have. It might be that you're struggling with you're still going to the pub and still drinking. It might be something like you, you, whatever it is that is stopping you from having a good relationship with the Lord. What's happening is that thing is coming between you and God. And what it is, you, you think you can't get rid of it because you need it. Yeah, but God's saying, I want it gone because you can't have a good walk with me. You can't have the full promises of me. You can't have the full protection what I can give you. You can't have all them things. You can't have that peace and comfort unless you get rid of this thing. And that's, that's what we do. We start struggling with God. We start wrestling with God. And we think to ourselves, but Lord, you know I can't do this. Man. Lord, you know I need that. You know I need to still have that bad habit. You know I need to still have that addiction. You know I need to still go into them places. You know I need to still be doing them things to get a living or whatever it is. But let me tell you something. That's just wrestling with God. God is saying, give it up and I'll show you. Give it up and I'll show you. And it said that he wrestled with God all night long. Now, listen, I don't think and I know that God could have beat him at well i think he could just flicked him with his finger and he could killed him but he's wrestling with god all night and uh, you know what i've read this many many times before and it says it wrestled with it and got and the man god dislocated his hip and i thought that was it that was the end of it but if you read carefully it says that he's still he's still wrestling he won't let him go he won't let this go jacob is not he's licking he's hurting his, his hips but he's not letting go and that's how we've got to be. We might be hurting, things might be broken in our lives, things might be going, but we've got to hold on. We've got to cling to, and we've got to say to the Lord, I'm not letting you go until you sort this out. Yeah. I'm not letting you go until you show up and you just get rid of the problem, or you help me with this problem, or you help me go through it, or you is me, or you give me a piece about it. I'm not going to do it, but I need to cling on to you. And he's still done that while he's wrestling. It says, and Jacob's fire was dislocated while he was wrestling with him. Then he said to him, let me go for the day is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Verse 27. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. He says, what you, verse 28. He said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you are striven with God and with man and have prevailed. It seems like here that the God, first of all, it seems like when we read this, that God can't beat Jacob in a wrestling match. Right? Then it seems like God is not an all-knowing God because he don't know Jacob's name. But let me tell you something when he said to Jacob, when he said to him, what is your name? When Jacob said, my name is Jacob, he wasn't just saying, my name is Jacob. He was saying, my name is swindler. My name is deceiver. My name is supplanter. My name is, a, you know, a, my name is a, a robber. My name is a liar. He's saying all them things. He's admitting to God, that's who I am, God. I'm all them things. I'm not the, I'm not, I'm laid open, I'm laid bare to you. All them things, all them sins that separate me from having a good walk from you, to separate the promises that you have for me. All them things, 
That's what I am, Lord. That's what I am. That's what we need to do sometimes when we come to the Lord. We need to come to him in prayer and we need to say, Lord, that's what I am. You know where I am. Because sometimes what we do is we're, we're so good. We're, we're 99% Christians. We're so good in all them areas, all them good areas. And there's one thing. There's one thing that we're holding on to. One thing that has our old in our life. One thing that's old in us, anchoring us to this world. There's one thing that's keeping us where we, instead of going on in the Lord and having more and more of what God wants, it's oldness. Well, let me tell you something. The minute you start admitting that to the Lord, and it's not just a one-time event. It's not just saying, Lord, uh, help me with, I'm, I'm going to use drinking. Help me with drinking. Help me to stop drinking. It's not that the Lord's going to come in, get rid of drink, and that's going to be it. Sometimes we have to work with that. Sometimes we have to ask the Lord, strengthen me. Help me not go to the pub. Help me not have cans of lager. Help me not to do them things. We have to ask the Lord to strengthen them. When that's over with, when that's over with, something else will come along and we'll have to come before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Because you know when the, the, the people, when they come out of Egypt and they went into Israel, which was a long time after this, went into, God said this to him. He said, I'm going to give you this land little by little, lest it overcome you. And let me tell you something, we, listen, I know people can be transformed in an instant. I know God can come into their lives and transform them from one day we're facing one way and going the other way. But for some of us, like me, sometimes God is doing it little by little. He's cleaning up our lives little by little. Does it mean we're lesser Christians? No, it means that we're facing the same way, going the same forward. We're walking with the Lord. And as we're walking towards him, as, yes, we'll never be perfect until we leave this life. But as we're, as we're walking towards him, the things are dropping off. And we're getting rid of the things and we're saying, Lord, I don't want these no more. All these things that I'm doing, the swindler, the, the you know, the supplanter, all them things there, what Jacob was admitting, what he was, Lord, I'm getting rid of them. Help me to get rid of them. Give me the strength to do them. But the thing is, is we've got to cling on to, onto and hold on to because you will never, ever grow in the Lord. Listen, you might think to yourself, yeah, but you know what? I only do this, but so-and-so does that. And they're still going on the Lord. The difference might be, listen, I'll put it for instance, right? Let's, let's do drinking again. Let's say I drink and Jesse drinks. We both go to the pub. We both come to the Christians. We're both trying our hardest, right? To, I, I, want, I want the drink gone. I want the drink. Oh, he wants the drink gone. But my motive is, I want the drink gone because I want all you to think I'm a better Christian. But at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, Joe, I love drink. I like going to the pub. And I keep looking at Jesse and thinking, but Jesse drinks. It must be all right, Jesse drinks. But Jesse could be thinking to himself, Lord, I want it gone. It's, a, it's an addiction that I have and I want it, I'm struggling with it. And I'm going, let me tell you something, he's in a better place than me. Because he's saying, Lord, this is me. This is how I am. I want it gone. I want it got rid of. I want to have a better walk with you. But if I'm making up excuses because Jesse ain't giving it up, then you've got a relationship with the church. You've got a relationship with the people around you. You need a relationship with the Lord. Amen. You need to say to yourself, I need, I need to put my eyes on you. It's not how good I look to Jesse. I'm not, Jesse's not my plumb line. God is. Jesus Christ is. That's the plumb line. That's where I've got to be leveled to. Not people in the church. Because if you're level with people in the church, let me tell you something. If we start, if you look, if, you, if there's somebody in this church, you think to yourself, there's a, well, there's a, there's a young fella in the church back in um, Ivor. He's, he's our gauge. If, if he's gone for more than a month, the rapture's out and we've been left because he's that good of a Christian. So if you've got somebody like that in your church and you think to yourself, that's what I want to be like. I want to be like that man or that woman. I want to be like them. I want to see how they serve the Lord. Then you've put your eyes on the wrong thing because he will let you down. She will let you down. They will fall. Only God is there always. Keep your eyes fixed on the Lord. Keep your eyes firmly fixed on him. Don't think to yourself, Joe, I can do this on my own or they won't know. God knows. God always knows. And it's in that quiet times. If you're not in that quiet time when, you, when you've done something that's affected you between you and God and you sit there or you're praying and, it's, and you're not feeling, not, not guilty because guilty will push you away from Lord, but you're not feeling convicted of it. You're thinking to yourself, Lord, I've done wrong. Nobody knows about it but you, Lord. And I've done wrong and I want to put myself right. Or if you're like, if you're the other hand, you think to yourself, nobody knows, I've got away with it, then you need to come back to the foot of the cross. Because I don't believe you've ever met with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because once you meet with God, it doesn't matter how far you go or how long you've been. Once you've met with him, you, the experience that you've had with him, nothing compares with that. Amen. Nothing at all. Nothing compares with Jesus Christ. You'll always, you know, when that conviction comes, you'll always want to come back to him. You'll always think you're, even if you're in the world and you're backslidden and you're doing whatever it is. You, you say, every person I know that's been backslidden and come back, all they said was, I've done everything I could to drown out God. Everything I could. Partying, drinking, going here, going there. 
filled up the lives full of hobbies or whatever it was. And all it is, is drowning out God saying to them, you need to repent. You need to come back to the foot of the cross. This isn't the life that I had for you. The life I had for you is full of promises. But sometimes we've got to listen to that voice. Amen. If your heart is that you really want to go on with the Lord and you really want to be a different Christian, it doesn't matter how long you've been saved, and you want to be a different Christian this time next year, this time next week, then you're going to have to say, between you and God, you're going to say, Lord, I'm Caleb. And this is what's wrong with me. I need you to help me. I need you to help me get rid of this. I need this gone in my life. I need you to help me walk on this walk with you daily, Lord, and to trust in you. So he's got the fear. He's got this fear of Esau. He thinks Esau's going to kill him. He's got the fear of going back. But he knows he has to go back. And that's how God is. God will always put a call upon your life. He'll always say to you, no matter how far you've gone back into the world, no matter how deaf you are to the things of God, he will always give you chances to bring you back. He'll always bring you, try and draw you back. He'll always give you that chance. He'll always put somebody in your way to just say to you, you need to get back to the Lord. He'll always give that, that, that thing just to, this is what he knows. He says, I'm going back there because the Lord has told him he needs to go back there. In his mind, he's convinced he's going to be killed. It says he, he was wrestling with him. His fire's out of socket. He's changed his name to Israel, which means, uh, it means wrestling with God and also means to be governed by God. And uh, it says that he's, he left there, crossed over to the river, limping on his fire. So let me tell you something. Right, he is left. First of all, his brother's going to kill him. So best case scenario in his mind, he's going to have a fight with his brother. He's wrestled with God all night. He's ended up being a cripple. Now he's got to meet his brother. So it seems like God has hindered him, not helped him. Then it seems like, hold on, I've got this man wants to kill me. Instead of you helping me, instead of you, you've hindered me with this limp. I believe he had this limp, and he had this limp for the rest of his life, Jacob did. He had this limp, limp that every time he walked, he knew he had to rely on the Lord. You know, if he had to walk a distance, he had to rely on the Lord. When he come up to his brother Esau, he had to rely on the Lord. Every situation, every circumstance that come on his life, the limp would be a constant reminder, the pain would be a constant reminder of, you know, I have to rely on the Lord. And let me tell you something, anybody who's been backslidden, and they've gone in the world and their, their life's gone upside down. When they come back, yes, thank the Lord they're in church. Yes, thank the Lord God has restored them. Yes, thank the Lord they wish they should be. And listen, they're going to praise the Lord they're, they're where they should be and everything's good. But it always leaves them with a limp. It always leaves them with something. It always like they're not quite what they should be. They're not quite where they should have been. You know, that's a constant reminder that don't lean on your own understanding, as the Bible says, but lean on his. So he goes to his brother. He's with this limp. 400 men is coming. And he's, he's walking out in faith now. And he said this. Then he saw ran to meet his, his, him and embraced him, fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Let me tell you something. No matter what circumstance you're in, no matter how bad you think, you know, like if there's rails and arguments and you think, uh, I'm not going to get out of this Christian. The only way of getting out of this is if I row and argue back. If I row and fight back, I'll do this. Let me tell you something. If you put your tra trust and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he will show up and that your enemies will become just like this. Just like this. His enemy, who wanted to kill him the last time, the next time you see him, all he wants to do is embrace him and kiss him. That's all he wants to do. God, the God that we serve... Isn't the God up there somewhere in heaven, sitting on a cloud, with a, an, an old man, grey with a beard, that wants to throw a thunderbolt at you and kill you at anything? You, no, he's not that sort of God. The God we serve is a loving God, and he wants to restore our relationships, and he wants to keep you safe. He wants to, but you have to rely on him. You have to put your faith and trust in him. You have to realise, you know what, no matter what I'm going through, no matter what happens, no matter what life throws me, no matter how I feel, because if you go on feelings, they will let you down guaranteed because how many people didn't feel like coming to church tonight we're here thank the lord do you know what i mean how many people didn't feel like going here or going there but we're here don't go on feelings go on the fact that god loves you he saved you he set you free from your sin and he wants you to move on in him and he wants to give you the bible says that he wants to give you life and give you life abundantly but it's up to you you have to come to that point where you're wrestling with god and you have to say what you are and God will, God will honour that. 
You know, when we, when we um, come to repentance and we confess our sins, all that is is saying the same as what God knows. That's all. We're, we're only agreeing with what God says. You know, you're a dirty, rotten, filthy sinner. And all we say, Lord, I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy sinner. You're confessing to God exactly what he knows. You know, if you're in this place and your heart's been, especially like I know one of the brothers prayed about um, Christmas time coming up. Well, you need to use your, you need to use your prayer life like a bank account. If that's your weakness, Christmas, then that's what you need to be doing. You need to be, if you're praying for 10 minutes a day, you need to be praying 20 minutes a day. You need to be a constant putting it in prayer. Lord, give me the strength to get over this season. Give me the strength that when I get to January, I followed you, put you first. Yeah. If you're cold in the heart, you know, when you, you feel like you're distant from the Lord, then tonight you can put that right. Tonight you can say, Lord, you know where I am? You need to, and the Lord will come in and he will bless you and he will touch your life again. But you know, it's up to us, to whether we want it or not. We have to seek his face. We have to not think that, because the, the problem is with most of the Christians now, they think to come in church, that's it. Come to church, isn't it? Come to church, I'll come to church, we come to church because we need to get charged up. We don't, it's not a favour to God, that's for us. What we need to have is that personal relationship with him. It starts in the morning, reading your word, praying, going to church, fellowship with one another, keeping out of the places where you're weak. You know, where you stand at with God tonight, you know, if you're standing in fear or if you're standing in, you don't know what direction to go in or you're standing, it could be a sickness or an illness. And I would say tonight, stop wrestling with the Lord. Let him take full control and give it to him. Because otherwise you're not going to go on in the Lord all the time you're holding back and you've got an anchor in this world. Let's pray. Father God, I just want to thank and praise you this night, my Father God. Thank and praise you for your precious word, Lord. I thank you for men like Jacob, my Father God, that learns the truth of Jesus.